we're going to continue on here with liquid liquid extraction and uh, I'll, I'll recap what we did last time in terms of cross flow liquid liquid extraction and then today's class our main focus is going to be on counter current flow and uh, by the end of this you'll be able to do almost a pretty complete design for liquid liquid extraction to the point where you can quantify numerically what your recoveries and your concentrations are going to be. And that's, remember that was the discussion at last class, that's the important number we need in order to trade off between different choices of solvent flows, different choices of solvents, is to be able to calculate that recovery number. So that's where our aim is. So let's just quickly recap what we're doing here. As recall, we said we've got a mixing unit here, one, and we're going to take a feed into it as a fresh solvent. And after mixing in that first unit, we'll have an extract and a raffinate. So if we looked at that graphically, so you don't have the slide in your notes, but this is what we did cover last time, um, and it's in your prior notes, in fact. So we've essentially taken this unit, and we've mixed in solvent, and it's uh, these, these colors that are over here. So you've got solvent, and you've got the feed coming in. You've mixed it up, and you've got a mixture here, M1. Now, we've got leaving from that in equilibrium. We mix, and then we let it settle, and then in equilibrium we have leaving the extract in our raffinates. Okay, so let's uh, we'll draw our extract leaving off to the side. We call that the stream that contains the solute to a high concentration. That's what we're going to keep, and we're going to recover our solute from the one later on. But we also have the stream, the, ex, uh, the raffinates, the raffinate has some unrecovered solvent. So we don't want to throw that stream out. That was all, all our discussion last time was. But recognize that that stream R1 contains a lot of valuable material still. So there's still solute present in there. So what we do is we contact that the second time. So R1 now essentially becomes my feed into the next stage. So let's draw on stage two here. We'll create a new mixture. And we had, we had some discussion last time on how much solvent do we use. So coming in here the second time around, we can choose that solvent level. So this S coming in in the second go doesn't have to be the same amount of solvent that we used the first time around. So let's. Let's make, make that clear, that volume of solvent is S1, this volume of solvent, the next point is S2. So, but on the ternary diagram, they both start at this point. This corner point represents the pure solvent, because this diagram gives us information on concentrations, not on the mass flows. So S1 is a particular mass flow that you choose, and S2 is a mass flow that you choose. And what we, we will show in the tutorial, uh, sorry, in the assignment for yourself, is that for this sort of cross current setup, that those solvent flows are very high. Much, much higher than for counter current. So we're going to look at counter current today and prove that for counter current, we need much, much less solvent. But here in this cross current step, you pick what flow you use for S1, you also pick what flow you need for S2, you mix that up. So we create this mixture here, M2. Let that come to equilibrium. And we have leaving then, finally, R2 and E2. So then the raffinate from the second step and the extract from the second step. So you may still have un some solute here in R2, but there should be much less. Every time we add a new step here, notice R1. I have a concentration of about 9% solute. Now, adding a second stage, I've got a concentration of about 3 to 4% R2. So every stage we add, we reduce this concentration of solute down. So your choice is that, as a design engineer is how many stages do you use? That's one, one parameter you pick. And the other parameters you pick is what flow do you use for this solvent to treat a given feed F. So F you know, you know the flow rate of F and you know its composition, you get to pick S1, S2, S3, and so forth, and you get to pick the number of stages you need. So that's the design strategy for cross-current flows, which we looked at last time. 
Okay, so here are bills, uh, just a little bit of a summary on the left. In general, you'll find that not only do your, does your raffinate concentration go down with every stage, so R1 decreases, uh, sorry, R1 is greater than R2, which is greater than R3. So what I mean by that is every time you add a stage, this number becomes lower and lower. But also, E1 is high, E2 is low, E3 is low. Um, so every additional stage, you sort of get this diminishing returns. <coughs> there's some point where you have to just simply, there's no additional benefit of adding on a new stage. Now let's take a look at countercurrent. So this is new for us. But what countercurrent does is essentially it reuses the solvent. What I mean by that is, let's take a look at a countercurrent set. You see this countercurrent flow sheet from your 3M course. So this is the, the connections here are not new for you. But in this context of solvent extraction, what we're saying is we're feeding my fresh solvent over here. So there's no solute in there, there's very little solute. It's, it's ready to take up solute. So we put it into this stage two. So I'm just considering two stages for now. And it's going to be contacted with this feed over here. Well, that feed is R1 from the prior stage. Well, let's, let's then work from this direction for a minute. So here's my feed coming in. It's got a high concentration of solute, and it's going to be mixed up over here with E2. Now, what's E2? E2 is the solute that's been already picked up a little bit of solute from that second stage. So you can, you can start to see here that as I work from my feed, this is high solute. My solute is going to move out of my feed into, into this extract over here. It's going to get picked up. And every time we have an add a stage, we're going to change this profile. So solute is going to be very high, then a little lower, then a little lower still. And at the end, your raffinate should come up with very low solute. We'll draw that profile in today's class. By the end of the class, we'll have a diagram where we can see that concentration profile. That solute has to go somewhere. If it's disappearing from F to R1 to R2, getting lower and lower, it has to go somewhere. Well, it's going in to my solvent stream. So S has got no solutes in it, then E2 is going to pick up a little bit more, and then as I keep going, E1 is going to be heavily loaded. So my solute is going to come up here. So from an overall perspective, then, I can quantify my recovery in the same way. The, the equation for recovery doesn't change from counter currents to cross currents. Same equation simply says, what did you end off with in your raffinate? This should hopefully be low. So raffinate, recall, is the stream leaving that really should not contain any solvent. So this number here on the numerator should really be low, that XRN. That's the concentration of solute leaving in the final stage. And you divide that through by what you started off with. So we know my feed concentration and feed flow. So take the format ratio. And hopefully this number over here will be small so that your recovery will be close to 1. The question we're going to ask, ask and answer today is how many stages do we need and what solvent flow? Notice these two questions are identical to the questions we used here for cross current flow. How many stages and what solvent flow? So same two questions being asked for cross current flow versus counter current flow. That's your job as the engineers to make those two decisions. And what we're going to see is that for the same material that you need to try and process, counter current will always need much, much less solvent flow. Why is that important for us? Why is solvent flow so critical? Because we're going to have to separate out that solute that we want to get at some point out of the solvent. Okay. We're going to have to separate and treat that sol solvent, right? Well, I can say it's like usually we still make distillation to extend like the energy costs depend how much of the material you have to get up. Right. So. so we're going to have to treat that solvent later on. That stream E1 now contains the solute with solute <coughs> mixed up. We're going to have to heat heat up that stream in a distillation step to recover our solute and separate it from the solvent. So if we can get a much much lower solvent flow over here our energy requirements in that distillation column are much smaller. So that's really critical. We want a low solvent flow. 
Uh, solvent is also really expensive, so the less of it you have to purchase and have recycled through your, your process, the better. Solvent is also often toxic, okay, and it's a safety hazard from, from flammability perspective. So again, the less of this material you have lying around and need in your process, the more desirable that is. So countercurrent solvent extraction is you almost see is almost always the norm. Okay, so let's see where we're, where we're aiming for this. Um, so we're aiming to figure out the number of stages. We're going to do that using this, these triangular diagrams we've been dealing with the past few classes. We're going to look at that today. How do we estimate uh, the number of theoretical stages, or often called theoretical plates? But those theoretical stages, remember back in distillation column, you used the McCabe field diagrams, and you sort of stepped down those diagrams. Well, that's the same, same idea we're going to do here, just on a triangular diagram. But those theoretical stages, we need to convert that over into an actual distillation column or an actual solvent extraction column at the end. So the way we do it is quite straightforward. We let the vendor do the work for us. Right? Does that sound right? We let someone else do the work, right? So we figure out how many theoretical stages we need, and we go to the vendor and say, here, tell me, OK? That's pretty much what it comes down to, right? Uh, and the reason for that is fairly simple. Because the solute and solvent and carrier, those three fluids that we're dealing with here, there's no correlations that we can look up for all combinations of these materials. Right? Every person's case is going to be slightly different. And then what's in your column? Is it, is it going to be a packed bed? Is it going to be a discontactor? Is it going to be a pulsating column? Is it going to be a mix of secular? So the standard strategy always, always, always um, in all industries is you take a sample of your material to the vendor. They have a test rig. We saw in a, in a few slides back the some, a test rig that I showed you. And they do the experimental work for you. And they come up and tell you this number, H-E-T-S, the height equivalent to a theoretical stage. So they said for every theoretical stage you have in your diagram, you need this much height in your column. Okay, so they, they will help you with the design of that column. We won't, we, we won't ever do that ourselves. So the vendors, and there's many of them, they will go and give, give us this information. And you can also take a stage efficiency into account. Okay, so Simply take your height equivalent to a theoretical stage, multiply by the number of theoretical stages, that will give you your column height, and then you can divide through by a stage efficiency. That's a number that the vendor gives you as well. And that will get your, your size of the pack bed or your column. So here's an example I, I, um, I got recently. I was asking around a little bit on what's the latest in solvent extraction and, and as it happens, my father works a lot in this area, so he gave this information to me. This is a company in Japan that's recently put on the market a new type of column here. They've got an old column. This is the older guy. This is the newer guy side by side. Much, much thinner. Um, and the footprint is smaller in general for their technology. And inside, it, this is what's going on. So we've got our, our heavy liquid, the carrier with solutes flowing down, and then you've got your light liquid, your organic phase, or your solvent flowing up, up against it. And the, the, the patented technology is how you contact those two phases. So here's one example of this company's contacting. And, and two classes ago, remember, I showed you a whole lot of slides of different ways of contacting um, the material. So again, here the vendor would tell you, you know, for every theoretical stage you get on your diagram, you need two of these units per theoretical stage, or three units per theoretical stage. Okay, so the vendor works closely with you to do the work. But we still need to have a rough idea. Right? And so how do we do that? Let's take a look. So what we, what we say is, let's go look back at our system. And we'll, we're going to start small. Let's take a look at two stages for now. Then we'll go up to multiple stages. So then if we have two countercurrent stages, we simply do mass balances over every stage. So let's take a look at the first unit here. This is my first theoretical unit. I have a feed coming in, and I am going to also have this extract from the second stage coming in. So this is going to be my solvent phase. 
solvent. Group 2 contains mostly solvents and a bit of solute. So I'm going to mix F plus E2, that's my mass in. My mass out is the raffinate R1, leaving over there. So that's hopefully got less solute in it now. F, the solute feed coming in, has, has been removed, and R1 should have less solute. I also have extract E1 leaving. So that's my mass flows in and mass flows out for the first unit. Let's take a look at the second unit. Mass flows in this time. Now my feed to the second unit is R1, the raffinate from the prior unit, and also my fresh solvent coming in. So R1 plus S is mass in, and mass out then is R2 plus E2. Okay, so notice this terminology. We always use this terminology. It's a consistent manner that will help you that the mass flows out on the stage always have the subscript referring to that stage. So stage one, R1 and E1. Stage two, flows out are R2 and E2. So this is an important terminology to pick up on because when you go to five, six, seven stages, it's going to get pretty messy. And so that's, that subscript will help you keep it straight for you. Everything clear so far. Okay, mass balance is straightforward. Now let's rearrange this. Let's take, and we'll see why I've rearranged it this way in a minute. Rearrange this term, bring the E1 over to the left-hand side, and take the E2 over to the right-hand side, and form this difference in flows. F minus E1 is equal to R1 minus E2. So notice where those flows are. Here's F at the bottom and E1 at the top. So I'm taking this flow minus that flow. It's equal to the flow here on the bottom minus the flow at the top. So F minus E1 is equal to R1 minus E2. If I do that for the second unit, I also find that R1 minus E2, that same difference, is equal to R2 minus S. So always the same difference from the raffinate stream to the upper stream above it. So we have these differences here, and they're all equal to each other. R1 minus E2 over here from the first stage, R1 minus E2 from the second stage, so I can equate both, and I get three deltas. Three differences, and they're all the same value. And for convenience, I'm going to call that, that difference, I'm going to call capital P. Okay. So that's going to be important coming up on our slides next. So each difference there is the same delta P. That's mass, right? All we've done is a mass balance. So P represents an amount of mass. It's the mass flow difference between this stream and that stream, or any of these combinations of streams. Simply a difference in mass. Question. Is E2's mass larger or smaller than S? The, the difference in mass between E1 and E2. E1 is larger than E2, which is larger than S. Okay, so every stage, the solvent is picking up material. Okay, similarly, F comes in at some mass and, and loses it to R1, loses some to R2. Okay, overall, that steady state, your mass balance must still work. That your feed in over here, your global mass balance P plus your solvent S must equal R2 plus E1. So your global mass balance must balance, and within each unit, your balance must, must balance. Okay, now I'm going to rearrange those, those equations back again. <laughs> so we've we, we created differences. Now I'm going to create this form over here. So let's just go look back at our prior equation which said that F minus E1 is equal to P. Well that can be rearranged and written as F plus P is equal to E1. And you can go do that with the two other differences as well. So both instances down here we've got three differences. For every one of them you can go rearrange. The reason why I did that is we're going to use the mixing rule. Remember the mixing rule, the lever rule in that ternary diagram? 
says that if you mix one mixture with another, you can go find where that third point is. Okay. This is exactly what we've got over here. Um, why is it F plus O oh, F minus E one. Yeah, plus B. Okay. And thank you for picking that up. <laughs> These slow slides are being wrong there. Okay, so F minus P is E1, it doesn't matter. Okay, so please correct these, thank you, sir. So F minus P, R1 minus P, R2 minus P. Okay. The other way you could look at it is by saying F is equal to E1 plus P. Okay. That will help from a mixing rule perspective. So F is E1 plus P. What that tells me then is that there's a relationship between F, E1, and P on the ternary diagram. Remember the ternary diagram tells me how mixtures on, on that in a three-phase system will separate and what their concentrations are. I can then go use the lever rule to find every one of these points. I know F, I can find E1, I can then go find P. Or given P and E1, I can go find F. So any combination of them, I can go find the third entry. The key point is that all three points will be on a straight line and connect them. And what we're going to find a little bit unusual is that that connecting point is not inside the diagram. It's in fact outside the diagram. But the interpretation works just the same. So let's take a look at how, how we do that. There's six steps. And the first step is tells us if we're going to take a certain feed F, it's considered 250 kilograms in this example, and it comes in at this <coughs> composition, 24% solute and 76% carrier, so my feed point is over there, and I'm going to blend that in this first stage, and then that material in the first stage is going to move to the second stage, and get contacted with the solvent S over here, and leave an R2. But what I can do here, I want you to just consider the global mass balance, is I can do an overall balance over the system, and this mixture M then represents all the material inside my entire system at any point in time. So not, we're not looking at one stage, we're looking at the entire system. And there's a fictitious point M. M does not exist. M is simply a fictitious point that connects somewhere on the line between S and F. Where is M? How do I know that M is at that particular location? from S to M divided by the distance from S to F is equal to which quantity is equal to mass of F divided by the mass of F. Okay, so I know the mass of F, it's 250 kilos, I know the mass of M, it's the total mass coming into my system, S plus F. So I know that, I know that, I can measure that distance SF, so I can calculate that I'm not SF. Find a fictitious point M. So first step is really straightforward, is finding that fictitious point M.
Now let's take a look at the two outputs or two outlets from the system. There's two streams leaving, there's E1 and R2. I would like to know what E1 and R2's flows are as well as their compositions. Okay, that's a lot of unknowns. E1, R2, E1's composition and R2's composition. So what we always do with these liquid-liquid extraction systems is you specify one of the compositions leaving. Because that's our aim, right? Is, remember we said our aim is to design the number of stages and the solvent flow, and you're doing that in order to achieve a certain goal of a given extraction. So what we say is, well, let's design the system so that we can achieve R2, for example, at 5%. So we fix one of our, our points. I would like, you say, R2 to be at 5%. 10% or whatever number you, you choose, you would like a raffinate of no more than, let's, let's use 5% in this example. So that locates R2 over there. Why is it over there and not, remember this is 5%, so it could be anywhere along the 5% horizontal line. Why do I put it over there in particular? Is it the phase that it's coming out of? Any other? A little bit, it's half, half right. Yeah. yeah. Is it because you can assume everything can use that equilibrium? We're making the assumption it's leaving at equilibrium. So our key goal here, or key uh, assumption to bear in mind is that these are all theoretical stages. So assuming that theoretically we're achieving equilibrium, R2 must be on this dark black arc over there. So it's at that point, R2. Okay, so if I know where R2 is, and I know what S is, and I know what F is, can I find E1? And if so, how? So take a minute or two, talk with the person around you. How would you find where E1 is? Where is E1? You know where F is, you know R2, you know S. So can you find E1? So I, I'm assuming a solute balance. Yeah. A solute balance. Yeah. Okay, so XF A times the flow of phi, so solute coming in with phi, plus what else is coming in? Uh, the X S uh, A times S, but that's zero, zero yeah. because we've got no solute in our solvent, is equal to what's leaving. Let's take a raffinate. Uh, so xr2 times r2 2's flow, okay, plus 
the composition in the extract. So the stream leaving here in the top has a composition y e a y e one a times the flow of e one. Okay, so we know this guy, we know that guy. We've specified x r two. Three unknowns. One equation for a mark. When you specify your R2, then you know you can find out your P. Because that's your, that's your difference, that's how much you have leaving. Okay. And then that P is going to be the same for um, the amount that is like the difference that is like leaving your system. Okay, so you use the difference and you propagate through the, through the system to find where that P is. All that thought, we're going to use it next, but for here it, it, it's, it's going to be tough to use that because we don't actually know how many stages we have. Yeah, yeah, create a story. Um, could you draw a straight line through R2 and M and the point where it reaches the darker gauge? Okay, so draw a straight line through R2 and why can't we do that? I don't know why, right? <laughs> Because you looked ahead in the notes. I <laughs> well, no, cool. <laughs> yeah. If you consider the overall separation without the stages, then that would be what that line is, even though it happens in two different stages. Right. So if you have two stages or five stages, it doesn't matter how many stages you have, you can draw this line R2 through M and then keep going to this point over here. Because essentially what you're saying is there's this fictitious mixture M. M doesn't actually exist. But it, what is leaving from M is R2 and E1, and they will be on the straight line that connects them. And that straight line must pass through M. The key thing that you must not do is use the tie lines. Okay, because E1 is not in equilibrium with R2. So it's not correct to use a tie line. And that's, that's a common error. But what you must do and can do is consider that this mixture exists as a fictitious mixture, draw a straight line through M and R2, and just keep going with that line. And where it lands up on the equilibrium curve on the extract side is where E1 is going to be. So E1 lands up over there, and we can go calculate that composition E1 leaving. So with doing no work, pretty much, we've done no significant calculations, we can find all the inlet and outlet compositions. That's really interesting. Like we, we haven't said how many stages we need. All we found is what our exit and entry compositions are going to be. It's, the line will always be straight, right? Yeah. So it simply comes from overall mass balances that we can do that. And then I can go find my flows of E1 and R1, the masses leaving E1 and R1 <coughs> using the lever root. So I can go measure all my diagrams, distance E1 to M, M to R2, and I can go find those, those mass flows. So I can go find this, this flow, that composition, and I can solve for that solving balance. So everything else can be done with the lever root. But I still haven't figured out how many stages I need. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at that. This is where this fictitious point P comes in at mark this series. So P says, so now um, Sarah's kind of pointed out that my equations here are wrong. Thank you, Sarah. That's F minus P is equal to E1. Or well, the other way you can say that is F is equal to E1 plus P. Okay. That simply says that F, please correct this stuff that's in orange now. F is on the line that connects E1 and P. That's simply from our lever rule. So E1 is over there. I know where E1 is. I know where F is. So I can just draw a straight line through E1 and F Keep going and going. So I don't know where to stop yet. But I also know 
that let's correct the second one. R2 is equal to S plus P. So anything that like A is equal to B plus C, A must always be in between them and the line between B and C for from the lever. So R2 equals S plus P. It says connect S with R2. I know where S is. I know where R2 is. Keep drawing the screen line and where those two intersect is my operating point P. So P then is that intersecting operating point. We're going to use that then for all the other stages. Because as we saw earlier in that derivation, that the relationship between the intermediate streams also has P in it. So I found P from the first mass balance and the last mass balance where those intersect, I can find where P is, then I'm also going to use P on the intermediate balance itself. So let's take a look at, at that. What might, before we go on to the next slide without looking ahead, what is going to be the concentration of R1? How would we find the concentration of R1? You just go along the tide line, you can know that they're in equilibrium with each other, E1 and R1. Okay, E1 and R1 are in equilibrium with each other. Considering just that first stage, the extract and the raffinate E1 and R1 are in equilibrium with each other. So we know where E1 is, we can then draw a tie line, or, or interpolate with the existing tie lines, and find where R1 is. So that's on the next slide. I've taken away some of the other lines to be part of the diagram, but interpolate between the tie lines here to find where R1 is. So now I know where R1 is, then I can go use that operating point P again one, one final time to go find E2. So the relationship then is, please correct this as well, R1 is equal to E2 plus P. Or in other words, E2 and P are on a straight line and R1 is somewhere in the middle. So here's E2, R1 is in the middle, and put P on the opposite edge. Okay, so so we zigzag down. We found E1, come across, get R2. Uh, sorry, find E1, come across on the tie line and get R1. Project out to my operating points, bring a line back from P to R1, find E2, and we can keep going and keep going until we get our raffinate concentration to where we want. So if we come back another stage, now I my E2 is over here, I interpolate between these tie lines, so follow these two tie lines, I'm going to pretty much land up where I would like to be at R2. So following that tie line, E2 and R2, I can get to that point in two stages. So this is a little bit of a contrived example, I've chosen the numbers very carefully so I land up there in two stages, but typically you will either overshoot, or you have to overshoot your, your desired end. If you'd like to end up over there, and in this example, I end up kind of exactly on that point. In practice, you won't get to exactly on it, so you, you keep zigzagging across until you just overshoot your desired target. Anything unclear in that, in that derivation? Okay, I'd like you to try it out now for yourself. Um, so I won't go through this, this next slide, which takes it to multiple stages, because we've covered that conceptually uh, with that zigzagging. But I'd like you to try out, if you want the algorithm, there it is on, on this particular slide. So I think you're comfortable enough to follow that approach and try it out yourself now. So here we've got, I'll hand out some preliminary diagrams in a minute. You have a feed coming in at a given concentration. We would like, Two and a half percent in our raffinate, how many stages do we need? So, so work on that for the next few minutes and then we'll just at the end we'll work through it together.
describes your operating point continuously. Yeah, there's two, two for everyone. So you can practice and practice. Yeah, we push it um, it's usually around 5 to 5 to about 3. Yeah. Uh, you take 2? Uh, uh, 2 for uh, One and two of the questions for you to try at home, they're the, they're the regular cross current approach, but part three is the counter current. So part one and two is a good practice column for exams or for assignments. Oh, you can keep that. trying to locate, locate point M, a, sim a simple application of the lever rule. Um, so that, it's over there. But the rest of it you should be able to do quite quickly. So we've done that calculation many times, right? So it's something you can't with.
down here in the bottom right hand corner, connect a straight line through that point, through M, keep going and you get E1. So people are getting five stages, six stages, any other numbers? Okay, so there's the next step to calculate P. Most of you, or some of you at least, have got that. Okay, recall the, the reason why it's over there is because we know that E1 and P are going to be on the same line with F. So we can draw a straight line from E1 to F, we keep going and we'll land up at, at P. P also is on the straight line that connects Rn to S. So I can draw this line out here at a slight angle and this diagonal line from E1 through F. M is a fictitious mixture. It doesn't exist anywhere, but it's an overall mass in the system. So if you look back at these slides, there's no one change from the time. But M is that big of the mass in that big down How did you get Rn is given. Zero, there's ten percent, so five percent is two and a half percent. Okay, so E1, F, P, those points are easy to locate, S, R, N, and P. So most of you should be at this point, um, and this is, this is the important part to get. The next steps then are st stepping down through the stages. So uh, I'll, I'll show the first one over there. There's E1 and R1. They're connected on that tie line. And then once you've found R1, uh, you can go and connect through 
Uh, I'll put up the final solution and, and we'll work through it slowly next class. But essentially you work through uh, the tie line through R1 and you keep coming zigzagging back in P. And so you get up a very messy diagram, five stages, six stages of what people typically have. Um, but uh, so what I'll do is next class I'll take it up from this point on where we step from the first stage to the second stage and then you'll uh, see why we've got six stages.